How the Party Used Silence to Save a Dying Town, Part 2. The players are a little disappointed that there was no combat, but were so interested in the events that they were okay with it. A week later, the session begins right where the last left off. Make sure to check out the first part if you haven't. Link is in description. The party stops by the tavern, since they notice a few angry patrons leaving. They enter and see the orphan elf struggling to run the entire tavern on his own. He is unable to remember how he held the tavern together all on his own, or how it's been open for 150 years by his family if he has none. But he's too busy to worry about that and shoes the party off. They start literally chanting, Manor! 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 Both IC and OOC as they head straight to the Lord's Manor and demand to be led in by the guard. The guard, intimidated by this weird mob, demands they disperse this illegal congregation at once. They manage to persuade him, and he agrees to let them look around for one hour. As they head inside, the warlock senses a faint magical signature from upstairs. Everyone heads upstairs, except for the cleric and sorcerer, who head to the basement after a quick sweep of the ground floor. Inside the basement, the cleric rolls a nat 20 investigation and discovers a secret passage inside a particularly large wine barrel that leads into a cave system. Upstairs, the rest find a room with a crystal ball that had been used for divination in the writing of a flora and fauna of a Nana book in the same room. After flipping through searching for anything related to memories, they find an entry labeled the False Hydra. After reading what a False Hydra is, the warlock yells, STAY OUT OF THE BASEMENT! which prompts the cleric and sorcerer to head upstairs. They meet in the foyer and catch each other up. The guard pops in and says, All right, time's up. You lot clear out of here. Despite only a half hour passing, the barbarian knocks him out and ties him up. While they discuss what to do next, they hear footsteps coming up the stairs. They all prepare for a fight, the alchemist with her hand on the cork of the deafness potion. The door opens and out steps the fence they met the night before. What are you guys doing? He asks before the party responds in kind. He says, Someone left the secret door open, and I come up to see a tied-up guard? What is wrong with you people? Hurry up and come downstairs. Upon further questioning, assisted by high intimidation rolls, the fence reveals that this secret passage is the usual spot, where the Mafia does its black market business most of the time. They come out in a large cavern full of supplies and carts and whatnot, but devoid of anyone else. The fence explains that the town has miles and miles of old kobold tunnels under it that make convenient clandestine travel pathways. Especially since he's the only fence in town. The party, deciding that the false hydra must be in the tunnels, take the potion that I said would last for four hours and head in, despite the fence insisting they'd only get lost without a map of the tunnels. Once they deafen themselves, I stop the white noise permanently. I also inform them that everything that has happened to them from the start of the campaign to when they deafen themselves, two months later in real time, two weeks in game time, has been a flashback. It's how their characters remember it happening. After traveling for a while and disabling old kobold traps, they find a brood room full of broken eggs, which they determine to be about three weeks old. The sorcerer concludes that the false hydra must have eaten the kobolds first and made its way up to the town, likely devastating the mafia in the crossfire. The party communicates through the Kaloshtar's mind link and minor illusion spells. They find a tunnel to the surface and emerge. The first thing they notice is that there are blood smears everywhere, on the street, on houses, and even bits of gore laying around. Next they notice three long necks stretching up over the rooftops, ending in grotesque heads, their horrible mouths hanging open, clearly singing the song that they no longer hear. A fourth head drags a fresh corpse between two houses. A woman trips over a neck and gets up walking on as if it never happened. In fact, the townsfolk are all completely oblivious to these things. They try their best to act as if they don't notice, so as not to attract the Hydra's attention as they head to the town guard headquarters. Inside, they tell the guard captain and his lieutenant about the situation and disclose their evidence. There was still some deafness potion left and the guard agrees to assist and take some. They decide to find the lair. They'd be better off finding the base of a neck and following it. A head gets a little too close, and the lieutenant panics, swinging his sword at it. The head chomps down on him, nearly biting him in half and dragging his corpse off, as the party pretends they don't notice. They follow the head from a short distance into a house's basement where they find a tunnel. It isn't long before they enter a large hollow, where they see the head consuming what's left of the lieutenant. Further back, they see the main body, a horrible swollen mass of flesh, with four additional necks going up into the ceiling through their own tunnels. The captain charges the head in a vengeful fury for his lieutenant. The other four heads burst into the cavern as the fight goes on. The captain quickly dies. 
A party member goes down, and the rest have low health, but they manage to kill it. They hear panic screaming from above and run outside, finding the town in a panic now that they can see everything as it really is. The four remaining town guards approach and are clued into what happened. The party extorts them out of some tax money before returning home. They receive a letter on the way that their portrait is finished, and the painter took the liberty of hanging it in their common room. As they enter the town, the alchemist deafens herself just in case, revealing a complete lack of false hydras in their home city, much to the now paranoid party's relief. As they enter their common room, they see the grand painting. They quickly notice a seventh person in the painting, and they panic, very aware that they must have been lost to the hydra. The seventh person is a half-orc, half-dwarven woman, clearly dressed in the raiment of a life cleric of Luthic, our half-orc barbarian's hand on her shoulder. They all check themselves for anything that's not theirs, and notice a distinct lack of healing potions. The alchemist has a bag of holding, and when she reaches in, she pulls out a shining golden maul, with a mud-encrusted diary tied to it with twine. The diary's inside is mostly ruined with mud and water, but there are a few entries later in the diary that are legible. The first few are snippets of their journey to Pekani, with the final entry talking about how she dropped the diary in the mud during the last fight with the forest entity, but the alchemist promised to try and fix it when they returned home. She reveals herself to be the barbarian's wife, talking of their past together, their future plans, and hopefully children. The last thing she writes is that she can't sleep and will take a walk around town to clear her head. The Barbarian takes the Golden Plus One Mall and the diary and quietly returns to his room. He doesn't remember there being a woman's set of clothing or various other womanly trinkets in his room, but he doesn't question it at all. The session ends there. What an incredible setup and execution of a false Hydra. I get chills every time I think about it. The subtle hints and clues the DM left for his players were masterful. Did you figure it out before the reveal? Please let us know and comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel All Things D&D. Our next video will be posted in three days, so stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content.